censorship and repression was always used to keep movements for abolitionism, for, for civil rights and, and anti-colonialism down, uh, whereas the colonizers and slave owners and so on would use these uh, repressive means to quell resistance. But that history seems somehow to have been forgotten even though it's been staring us in the face all the time. And I think that's crucial to sort of re-remembering that crucial history of free speech and, and not just thinking that, oh, well, okay, maybe free speech played a, an important role in the past, but now we can limit it for good purposes and, and none of the nefarious effects will materialize. Hello and welcome to The Brendan O'Neill Show with me, Brendan O'Neill. This is a podcast in which an esteemed guest joins me to talk about the big ideas, the bad ideas, the problems and the controversies of life in the early 21st century. In this episode, I am delighted to be joined by Jakob Mushungama. Jakob is a Danish lawyer, human rights advocate and committed defender of freedom of speech. He is founder of Justitia, a think tank based in Copenhagen that focuses on free speech, human rights rights and the rule of law. Jakob has written widely on issues relating to freedom and rights. He has been published in numerous Danish and Norwegian publications and also in National Review, Foreign Affairs, Quillette and Spiked. From 2018 to 2020, Jakob hosted the much praised serial podcast, Clear and Present Danger, A History of Free Speech. And he is the author of the new book, Free Speech, A History from Socrates to Social Media. Let's start off by sketching out just how serious the crisis of freedom of speech is, or, or, or the free speech recession, as you refer to it in your new book. And you've got some statistics in your book, which are quite alarming, even to someone like me, who is very worried about the state of freedom of speech. So you talk about how few countries have meaningful freedom of the press right now. You also talk about the fact that in 2016, only 13% of the world's 7.4 billion people enjoyed freedom of speech, and a far larger majority of people lived in countries in which censorship was fairly normal. So the problem, the crisis of freedom of speech, the, the free speech recession is a pretty serious global problem, isn't it? It is. I, I mean, you can look at it, uh, you know, if you want to look at it in a more positive way, you could say, well, we're living in a golden age of free speech because free speech has become a constitutional and human rights norm. You know, technology has provided us the ability to to practice uh, free speech, even if free speech is not protected uh, legally. You know, so so speech is ubiquitous in, in a sense. Mm. Uh, and, and it's certainly much, you know, no one in, in the UK is facing the same troubles that Tom Paine would, would <laughs> face when he sort of criticized the political and religious establishment of British society in, in the 1790s. So in that sense, you could say it's a golden age. But as you mentioned, I, I see, see it as that golden age is in decline. So, so, so it's a free speech recession in the sense that it's not, it's not really surprising that authoritarian states are cracking down on free speech, you know, from the overthrow of, of the Athenian democracy, which, which happened twice by sort of oligarchic regimes, the very first thing that they that they cracked down on was was free speech and, and their opponents. And and when authoritarianism is on the march, uh, you can be certain that free speech will actually be the first victim. But what I think is the most alarming part is that democracy seems to have lost faith in free speech as a foundational principle. It's not that you know. For all the laws in the online safety bill in in the UK, uh, Nets DG in Germany, and so on, I don't think our politicians in democracies think that free speech has become worthless or that they want to do away with it. It's that they see it as perhaps just one value among many others that, that has to compete with different values. And, and sometimes, and especially now, endangers other values, and therefore we can't attach the same weight to free speech as perhaps we would in the 90s uh, or the early 2000s when uh, liberal democracies were confident that their value systems would sort of be the dominant one around the globe and where the public sphere was still sort of dominated by institutional gatekeepers and they they didn't have to contend with the unwashed mob of social media <laughs> <laughs> that this seems to alarm a, a lot of people both uh, among politicians and and also in sort of elite media and cultural uh, institutions um and again you know 
the effects in liberal democracy is 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 nothing like you know what's going on in, in Hong Kong or, or or China or or even India, but it still erodes what I ultimately believe to be the most important bulwark of free speech, namely the culture of free speech. Yeah. Sort of that a critical mass of people in any given society must accept as a foundational value that you know their that people can hold uh, ideas and, and express ideas that they themselves find to be utterly loathsome uh, and that people are free to do so and should not be fired or suffer any consequences uh, for that other than being opposed with with the opposing views. That actually brings me on to what I wanted to dig down a little deeper uh, with you from from the book. So you talk there about the, the, the most important aspect of freedom of speech being the culture of freedom of speech. And, you know, there can be as many laws and legal guarantees of freedom of speech as one likes, but if the culture of it isn't healthy and vibrant, then it's not going to exist as a meaningful value in society. And um, one thing that you d- you address in the book quite a lot is the loss of faith in freedom of speech in Western liberal democracies. And it's very it's a very interesting, contradictory situation, as you've just described, where on the one hand, we are guaranteed freedom of speech all the time. It's there in human rights legislation, although it often comes with numerous caveats at the end. You, you know, you have freedom of speech, except in the following situations. But it, it, so it's guaranteed to us in human rights legislation. Politicians still pay lip service to freedom of speech. It would be a brave politician who stood up and said, I hate freedom of speech. So you have this kind of legal guarantee of it, but the culture of freedom, the culture of free exchange, and that openness and robustness and willingness to hear alternative points of view, that culture is the thing that seems to be waning. So you talk about this this loss of faith in freedom of speech, and I wanted to ask you, if you think it's been a long time coming. I mean, you you describe very well how the consensus around freedom of speech among liberals in particular seemed to decline enormously during the Trump era. Mm. So during the Trump era, it came to be seen as heretical to have alternative ways of thinking or to deviate from liberal orthodoxy. So that seems to have exacerbated the crisis of freedom of speech. But do you think it precedes that? And it's this declining faith among Western liberals in freedom of speech has been growing for some time. I think, but I think, you know, it, it, it's, it's not limited to Western uh, liberals. We certainly see now, you know, Republicans in the U.S. who are not, you know, in, using state power to, to limit f- yeah. uh, academic freedom and, and free speech. So, so I think it's, it's basically hardwired into human beings to be uh, intolerant. I think, you know, our, the original software that we come with its default setting is perhaps uh, intolerance and then free speech is this patch that has been built on top of it and and that patch is is constantly uh, under threat from our original software which which threatens to override it and sort of go back to its default setting of of intolerance and and whenever you know whenever you have fraught situations where you have political tribalism and and people sense at their values and the institutions that have provided meaning and security uh, and progress for them for a long time are under threat and uh, there's uncertainty i think we tend to go back to want to to punish ideas or, or limit ideas that that we find might be be dangerous to, to those uh, values so so i think you know it's probably around 2005 or something like that, that we start to see uh, a loss in it. You know, for me, the big eye opener was the cartoon affairs mm-hmm. in, in Denmark, where uh, Jyllands Post, a Danish newspaper, published cartoons, some of them depicting the, the Muslim prophet uh, Muhammad, and where suddenly secular uh, liberals who saw themselves as the the 21st century heirs to the Enlightenment, and who would have always have, have argued that it's imperative to be able to criticize and mark religion suddenly turned around and said, you know, this is, this has nothing to do with, or at least they said, you know, this is an abuse of free speech. We're, you're punching down on a vulnerable minority. This was not what free speech was supposed uh, to do. And, you know, if memory serves me correct, in Britain, you came within one, one vote or something like that to have a law against religious hatred under the Blair government. It was only sort of renegade members of the House of Lords uh, or something like that, that, that prevented a, a very sort of 
strict religious hatred bill that could potentially have limited its essential debates about uh, Islam, extremism, and, and multiculturalism. So I think around that time you saw, and, and you know, there was a similar reaction in, in the Netherlands. So uh, Theo van Gogh, this Dutch filmmaker who had very, very strong views on, on Islam and didn't pull any punches, was murdered on the streets of Amsterdam. And then the minister, Dutch Minister of Justice goes out and say, let's revive our blasphemy ban. Mm. Sort of say, you know, we, we need to appease these minorities because our standard of free speech is, is excluding them and hinders peaceful coexistence in multicultural societies, basically. Hi, it's Fraser here, producer of The Brendan O'Neill Show. Regular listeners will have heard me talk before about ExpressVPN, and there's a good reason for that. Did you know that your internet service provider knows every single website you visit? And what's worse, they can sell this information to ad companies and tech giants who will use your data to target you. ExpressVPN puts a stop to all this. It creates a secure encrypted tunnel between your device and the internet so that your online activity can't be seen by anyone. I use ExpressVPN on all my devices. It works on everything, phones, laptops, even routers. You just fire up the app, click one button and you're protected. It's so easy. To be honest, it's so fast and simple to use. I hardly notice it's there most of the time. Then I can go about streaming my favorite content from around the world, or I can send and receive confidential information over the internet, safe in the knowledge that there's no big brother watching over my shoulder. That's why ExpressVPN is the world's number one rated VPN by Mashable, The Verge, and of course, by us at Spiked. So if you're like me and you believe your online activity is your business, secure yourself today by visiting expressvpn.com slash Brendan. If you use our exclusive link, expressvpn.com slash Brendan, you can get an extra three months for free. That's expressvpn.com slash Brendan. So I wanted to dig down into different freedom of speech issues with you. And so we may as well kick off with the one that you've just mentioned, which I think is absolutely uh, essential to understand in the free speech recession and the crisis of freedom that we are living through, which is the cartoons controversy, the Muhammad cartoons controversy, right from the Danish controversy in 2005 through to the Charlie Hebdo massacre in 2015. And what that revealed about um, Western attitudes towards freedom of speech at the moment, because for me in particular, I've, I've always supported freedom of speech all of my adult life, but that period of time was a very uh, important eye-opener for someone like me, and I'm sure for many other people too, in terms of just how clearly it illustrated the extent to which the intellectual elites had turned their back on freedom of speech. So you had a situation where even Amnesty International was saying in response to the cartoons controversy, well, freedom of speech comes with responsibilities. In other words, yeah. you know, use your freedom more responsibly and then these things won't happen. After the Charlie Hebdo massacre, uh, there were many disturbing examples of almost a level of apologism for what had happened or or certainly a reluctance yeah. to defend this magazine this newspaper from the assault that it suffered so uh, when pen america for example gave an award of a bravery award to the staff at charlie hebdo there was a backlash from some prominent novelists and thinkers and writers who said well we can't be given an award to this scurrilous magazine that punches down at oppressed muslims and it was reminiscent of the salman rushdie affair of of course, in the late 1980s and early 1990s, when uh, you had this extremist opposition to the exercise of supposedly blasphemous speech. And then the, the liberals who you would expect to have been on the side of the person speaking were not on the side of the person speaking. So how do you think we got into that kind of situation where even Islamist extremism that is deployed to the end of punishing people for blaspheming against Muhammad, even that is not seen by many in the West as being particularly problematic. Well, a, a charitable interpretation is that it is motivated by good intentions. So uh, in the sense that liberals cognizant of past injustices 
against minorities and, and, and colonialism and so on, on, on oppression that were real problems and, and to a certain extent still exists, even if perhaps sometimes exaggerated, sort of seeing the cartoons as part of uh, basically a, a racist or Islamophobic or a, and, and a bigoted campaign against Muslims, because there had been sort of real vociferous discussions about uh, Islam and integration in Denmark. And th- there certainly was an element on the right that had strayed from sort of criticism of Islam into outright anti-Muslim bigotry. Uh, and and so I think that the debate became toxic that in that it's very difficult for many people to separate between defending the principle of free speech while being able to criticize what is being said. You know, many times people will not defend free speech because they then see it as legitimizing uh, the speaker. And therefore, free speech sort of became, in, in, in those years, sort of a right-wing position, and, and it was interpreted, I think, by many liberals as basically a cover for for engaging in, uh, in, in racist or anti-Muslim uh, uh, bigotry, which, of course, is a huge failure in, because the free speech doesn't mean a thing if you're only willing to defend it when it's being exercised by those with whom you agree or who say something that doesn't really isn't really consequential. On the other hand, I think my experience afterwards was that certainly there were a lot of people on the right who were actually selectively invoking free speech in the cartoon affair and using it sort of as free speech is great, um, or free speech is under threat by Islamists, but then turn around when laws were being passed against Islamist extremists that, yeah. that, that limited free speech and then suddenly said, yeah, free speech is important, but <laughs> you know uh, we have to carve out these exceptions because if we don't limit free speech uh, to say free speech, free speech will, uh, will, will basically uh, will end up with a caliphate. <laughs> you know, I'm only slightly exaggerating. But I think you know, the liberal position could have been to say we need to defend this principle and then call out people on the right when they were being um, transparently hypocritical. You know, th- that would not have taken anything away. And you could also show concern for minorities um, <laughs> while defending the right to blaspheme yeah. against origin. And I think, you know, one of the hopefully strongest points of my book, at least one that, I, that I'm very eager to, to hammer home, is that free speech throughout its history has been, you know, one of the most powerful engines of equality for minorities and that minorities have been able to rely on. And, you know, that, there's a very powerful clip on YouTube by, by Shiraz Mar, of, um, who's, who's a UK sort of anti-extremist um, expert and who was a fem- former member of his And he's, he, he recounts, you know, the story of how he came to leave his and he's sort of standing in a Hispateria demonstration outside the Uzbek embassy in London, I think. Uh, and, and, and sort of he's protesting against the violation of human rights of, of Muslims in Uzbekistan. Uh, but he's, he's doing so in, you know, with the banners of an or, organization that, you know, if they had the votes or the power, would introduce a totalitarian caliphate in the UK. And then suddenly he said, you know, I'm standing here, I'm exercising my right to freedom of expression as an association. <laughs> and it's only the secular liberal values mm. of modern UK that allows me to do so. And then suddenly he just couldn't, the cognitive dissonance just you know, became too much. And he just, and he left his bacteria. And I think, you know, that, that, that's a good example of what free speech uh, can do for minorities. And of course, even more powerfully, when it comes to slavery, the civil rights movement, to you know, British colonialism, censorship and repression was always used to keep movements for abolitionism, for, for civil rights and, and anti-colonialism down, uh, whereas the, the colonizers and uh, slave owners and so on, white supremacists, would use these uh, repressive means to, to quell uh, resistance. But that history seems somehow to have been forgotten mm-hmm. Mm-hmm even though it's been staring us in, in the face all the time. And I think that's crucial to sort of re-remembering that crucial history of free speech and, and not just thinking that, oh, well, okay, maybe maybe free speech played a, an important 
role in the past, but now we can sort of separate the beneficial effects of free speech and, and we can limit it for good purposes and, and none of the nefarious effects will, will materialize. Yes, I want to come back to that question of the intimate relationship between freedom of speech and progress and equality, which really shines through in your book. And I think it's the most important point uh, and one of the most important points we need to make in the contemporary period. Uh, But before we get onto that, I just wanted to just ask you one more thing in relation to the problem of Islamist extremism and freedom of speech. And I think you make a very important point there about the hypocrisy of many on the right. And we certainly had that in the UK, where some of the people who I was standing shoulder to shoulder with in criticizing the Islamist assault on Charlie Hebdo or on newspapers would suddenly turn around and say, well, we can't have this Islamist extremist speaking in a British university because he'll warp people's minds and everything will get worse. And no appreciation for their own inconsistency and the way in which they Mm. themselves were undermining freedom of speech by arguing that certain extremists shouldn't enjoy it. And we saw similarly after the beheading of Samuel Paty, which was obviously a grotesque assault on freedom of speech, but then the French authorities' response was a very severe clampdown on Islamist speakers, Islamist preachers, Islamist groups. And uh, one of the points we made on Spike was, you know, where's the pushback against that? If we're serious about freedom of speech, we need to defend it for every section of society. But one thing, one point you make very well in the book is about the uh, the jihadists' veto and the foolishness, I guess, of giving strength to that veto. So you make the point that a, a blasphemy ban or, or a clampdown on on so called Islamophobia indirectly legitimizes the jihadists' veto rather than confronting it. So I wanted to ask you what you think the relationship is. I know it's a messy one and it's not sometimes not easy to define, but what do you think is the relationship between Western society's own uh, crisis of faith in freedom of speech or their abandonment of freedom of speech and the growth of these Islamist extremists who think that they also have the right not to be offended. They have the right to punish people who dare to impact mm. on their self-esteem or impact on their religious convictions. Do you think there's a relationship between those two things where the kind of Islamist militants are almost like the militant wing of cancel culture, of political correctness, Mm. of a society in which we're all taught to believe that we have the right not to be offended? I think they're certainly emboldened by it. Uh, I think you probably have to go very, very far out on some, on the extreme left where you, uh, to find people who, you know, actually feel that it's sort of, legitimate resistance yeah. <laughs> to, to behead uh, editors. Most, that most people will say, this is awful. We, we're completely opposed uh, against violence, yeah. but they should have been more considerate or they shouldn't have ab- abused free speech. So we're in no ways aligned with ISIS and so on. But I think that the jihadists are certainly emboldened by it. And, and perhaps they see they see those who, who sort of protest against cartoons as uh, useful idiots, if you yeah. like. Mm. more than ideological brethren, that might be the, a better way to describe the, the relationship. But I think uh, related to that, I think one of the the problems with free speech is that it doesn't provide the same degree of social cohesion. It doesn't bind people together in the same way that religion or nationalism does. So, you, you know, Only when you're sort of being oppressed does free speech really. So, you know, you could have enlightenment figures who, who it bound them together that they were fighting to expand the public sphere and use free speech as a a way to dismantle uh, religious orthodoxy and absolutism. Or take the American founding fathers who saw free speech as the great bulwark of liberty and sort of continuously hammered how the British would use seditious uh, libel laws to um, crack down on their, on their criticism of, of the laws introduced by, by, by the Brits in the American colonies. But then once they'd won the Revolutionary War, then suddenly free speech amplified the ideological differences between the revolutionaries. It didn't bind them together. And then you opt for something else that can create the values that needs to bind you together. And then suddenly you have you know, uh, Alexander Hamilton and John Adams, who are in favor of, of adopting the Sedition Act, 
basically go after their political opponents uh, in Democratic Republican opponents, um, basically supporters of, of Madison and, and and Jefferson. So so I think that's one of the the, the problems with free free speech and one that is not easily remedied just because being bound together by my religion or, or, or nationalism is just a much stronger glue. Uh, and also the unfortunate effect of that is that if, we, if you're bound together by nationalism or religion, you might feel that free speech is actually a threat to that and, and legitimizes crackdowns on, on free speech. Yeah, I think w- one of the points that comes across very well in your book is the uh, is the fact that freedom of speech is a risky business. This is, you know, it's it's not all smooth sailing. If people are allowed to say whatever they want and to think whatever they want, a point I've I've often tried to make is that that can often lead to more argument, more tension, uh, or at least an exposure of underlying tensions in society, which is arguably a good thing in itself because it's coming to the surface rather than being suppressed and intensifying somewhere else under the surface. So um, I think that's a that's a very important point, and it kind of draws me on to the other issue I wanted to ask you about, which you've already alluded to, which is. Um, the changing understanding of freedom of speech among people who would describe themselves as progressive or radical. You talk about different ways in which freedom of speech, the the understanding of it has changed. So, for example, in relation to the issue of racial equality. So in the past, freedom of speech would have been seen as absolutely essential to making the case for, for racial equality, breaking against the censorious tendencies of of. Uh, slave owners or racist politicians or politicians who wanted to maintain an unequal status quo. Freedom of speech was seen as the greatest weapon against that. And you talk about Frederick Douglass, who is one of Spike's heroes. And one of his key points in terms of his arguments about abolishing slavery is that he, he argued that slavery could not have survived freedom of speech. If there had been freedom of speech, it would have allowed the expression of ideas, the uh, association of oppressed peoples, the coming together of that kind of desire to strike out for your rights. And you fast forward a few centuries and anti-racist campaigners in the in the 2020s tend to see freedom of speech more as a threat than something that is is beneficial to them. So the Black Lives Matter movement, for example, is is very wary of freedom of speech and and often sees it as a cover for racist ideologues just to carry on with their usual business. So how do you explain that breakdown in in relation to progressives in particular, who who traditionally understood the importance of freedom of speech and now seem to see it as a threat? You're absolutely right. I mean, Frederick Douglass is probably the one who is you know, if you go back and read his a plea for free speech in Boston from 1860, which in itself was a response to cancel culture yeah. in the sense that <laughs> he was giving a speech at an abolitionist meeting and it was disrupted by white Bostonians who, who didn't appreciate his message because it sort of endangered the union and their commercial interests in the South. And he addresses all the, the, the issues that we discussed today, private public distinctions, racial equality, power privilege, and the importance of a universalist uh, ideal of, of free speech that doesn't depend on the color of your skin or the size of your wallet. So I think, you know, paradoxically, it's probably that progressive opinion on these things have become much more the norm. Mm. And more of an elite position in in many ways than before. And whenever you, whenever you are in such a position, it's tempting to use that power to limit ideas that you don't like. So, th- as I try to show in the book, that's a dynamic that we that we see throughout. Uh, also, I think that it's probably based. Also, on, on some degree of, of historical ignorance, but also that we tend to take free speech for granted in many ways. So, in I think many in the West don't think you know when if you're demonstrating if for Black Lives Matter, you're not thinking of it as exercising your First Amendment rights. Even though if you went back forty or fifty years and you try to have as uh, loud and uh, <laughs> Uh, a, a demonstration that you know would sometimes stray into violence. You've tried to do that in in the South, you know, forty or fifty years ago. 
you would be probably be on the wrong end of a batong and 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 some police dogs, and there would have been sort of laws in in place to to crack down uh, uh, on that. So you take your own right to free speech for granted. You you perhaps even don't think of it as exercising uh, free speech, while you see others whom you are ideologically opposed to their statements or expressions. You see that uh, as a threat. To your to yourself, uh, and 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 also just uh, it's probably not only free speech, but sort of the liberal ideals are no longer in the same de- degree, you know, invoke among many progressive liberals. I I guess it's you know these are not seen as liberating values; they're seen as sort of part of of oppression and and maybe you know something that that needs to be dumped on the ash heap of of history because they stand in the way of creating the perfect just uh, society where unequal uh, power relations can be equalized through um, limiting the free speech of those who are seen as having a privileged access due to their skin color or social political status and, uh, and so on. And I think, you know, that's an extremely misguided and dangerous idea I, I think if we look at the history of free speech if you if you limit the rights to speak you know of some group you you don't really you don't equalize free speech you are you ultimately invert power relations mm-hmm. so if you take uh christianity it, it started off as a, a weird uh jewish cult and then morphed into a separate religion that was persecuted by the romans and then it becomes ultimately the state religion of the Roman Empire, and suddenly Christian rulers start uh, persecuting not only pagans but also heretical uh, Christian yeah. sects, and, and do it for for a very long time. So this small cult that was persecuted has suddenly grown into a, a great persecutor. You you see the same with socialists in nineteenth century Europe. So Marx was hounded around Europe for for his opinions, and and many socialists were arrested, uh, censored, and so on. And what happens when the Bolsheviks come into power uh, in, in after the Russian Revolution? Well, the first thing they do away with is uh, freedom uh, of the press. And, you know, until modern China, I, I guess the, there never was a society that more systematically limited free speech than the Soviet Union under Lenin and especially Stalin. So, so that's another example. Or you could take, you know, uh, President Erdogan of Turkey. So back in, let's say, 2006 or something like that, he was uh, he was I- imprisoned uh, for reading sort of a religious poem that, that was seen as terrorism or religious hatred by, by the government at the time. And he was declared a prisoner of conscience by Amnesty International. <laughs> and then he becomes <laughs> president of, of, of Turkey. And then he just adopts a tsunami of laws uh, to, to crack down on, on, on his critics. Um, so, and, and of course, you know, who, whichever, whether it's groups on the left or the right, if they come into power and say, oh, we're going to create equality through limiting free speech, what in rea- reality they will do is that they'll impose an orthodoxy that, with themselves at the top and their opponents at the bottom. I wonder if one of the, one of the reasons why, um, progressive movements and progressive people, I mean, who knows what that word really means anymore, but we have a general sense of what it, of at least of what it used to mean. But I wonder if one of the reasons why progressive groups and people have turned away from freedom of speech is because the nature of progressive movements itself has changed very dramatically. So if you go back to the civil rights movement of the 1950s and 60s, for example, there was an optimism. There was a desire to uh, to be a, a free and equal member of society or of the American Republic. In that instance, there was a an aspiration to to play that role in society and a, a belief in your own capability of doing it, and your belief in the uh, ability of the American Republic to have that situation if it really wanted to. So there was a sense of optimism, and you quote. Um, John Lewis, uh, you talk about John Lewis in the book, and one of my favorite quotes is, um, without freedom of speech and the right to dissent, the civil rights movement would have been a bird without wings. So that kind of real sense that freedom of speech is essential to our project of raising ourselves up so that we are free and equal members of society. Whereas today, uh, what is presented to us as progressive politics sometimes feels a bit more 
depressing. You know, um, we're vulnerable, we're at risk. Uh, words hurt us. Um, everything feels oppressive. There's a horrible free speech is killing us. Yeah. As, as, as was the headline in a in a New York free Times. Free speech, you're erasing us. Your words are erasing us. So, and you know, we live in a horrible patriarchal white supremacist society where even asking someone about their hair or where they come from is a terrible expression of of hatred and and racial uh, demonization. So, it, is the shift really does the does the declining faith in freedom of speech really speak to a declining faith? in humanity, I suppose, and in our own ability to be robust, autonomous individuals who can play a, a proper role in society. It probably does. It probably also has something to do with the fact that the generations who advance these ideals have not themselves, you know, they don't have any memory of a time where free speech was being denied. Mm -hmm. So they, they cannot really... For someone who grew up during the Cold War, you know, even if you yourself did not live under the totalitarianism of fascism, it was very easy for someone in the West to see the difference between living in a in a society with free speech or not, because you could just look at what was going on in, in communist countries. So free speech was sort of uh, still seen by by many liberals or, or all, I guess as an essential value that really distinguished free societies from others. So you don't have that very visual thing and, and you don't have the sense of what it means to live without mm -hmm. uh, these freedoms. And also, I, I guess it comes back to sort of, if you live in a world where, you know, you perceive injustices and, and they're not addressed by free speech, but in fact, free speech gives a voice to those who you see as being part of the problem, and you don't have that sense of, of meaning and purpose in your life, then free speech becomes this, yeah, a, a value which is not important, but it sort of stands in the way uh, of, of progress. I see, you know, I see some of the same dynamics with, with some of the sort of the, the new right, which, <laughs> which uh, is, is sort of harking back to the days where, uh, you know, thrown an altar were, 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 were deciding uh, things, you know, this, that, that, Free speech, these liberal values are sort of entrenching degenerate values. So people lack meaning and, and free speech does not necessarily, you know, free speech allows you to cultivate me. You can try and find meaning through literature, through having, you know, interesting discussions with people. By, but by in and, in and of itself, free speech does not provide you meaning. So it can be seen as sort of an extreme form of relativ relativism. If your state is neutral and doesn't back a specific vision of the good society, everything becomes meaningless. And maybe you will urge to belong to some movement that uses state power for a higher good. Uh, and whether that is a progressive utopia or it's sort of uh, reviving the Holy Alliance <laughs> uh, of, of, of early 19th century uh, Europe, uh, uh, free speech is, is a part of the problem and something to be. Uh, downtrodden, if you like. I think that's a, that's a really important point, how in an era in which there is a crisis of meaning or people feel that they lack meaning and purpose, freedom of speech can sometimes be experienced as chaotic because there is so much to choose from and the responsibility falls on you as an individual or you as a community to discuss and work out amongst yourselves what you think your values are, how they should be put into the public sphere. You know, these are big tasks that I think in a time when people feel confused and at sea and atomized, that can seem like an overbearing responsibility, I guess. And it might feel a bit more comforting to simply say, well, the state should come in and prevent the expression of problematic ideas and green light the expression of acceptable ideas, because that feels safer and a bit more secure. And in, in relation to the breakdown of the relationship, I guess, between progressive politics and freedom of speech, I also wanted to ask you about the, just briefly about the history of feminism. <laughs> That's a whole podcast in itself, of course, but the, the, I guess the history of freedom of speech in relation to feminism. And one of the points you've made very well is that 
throughout history, uh, denying freedom of speech was instrumental to keeping women in a subordinate situation in society. And often women who express their points of view or express their feelings or express the desire to play an equal role in society were denounced as hysterical and crazy and, you know, put them in the ducking stool or put them in prison. So uh, even the, on, on that issue too, which of course has been one of the most significant and positive shifts of the past 100 or 150 years, which has been the equalizing of women and men, even there, freedom of speech, I think people tend to forget how central freedom of speech was to that project. Yeah. You know, one of my... <laughs> This anecdote, which, which for me really rammed home how essential free speech has been for, for gender equality was, so in, in 2018, I was living in New York and, and I took my, my children to a museum, uh, on the Upper West Side. And then we, we, when we left the museum, there was a big sort of anti-Trump women's march and, and tens of thousands of women were wearing pussy hats and holding <laughs> up placards and shouting things at the president, which were less than polite. And then the NYPD was standing by and protecting their First Amendment right. rights to criticize uh, the president. Now, if you get, if you rewind it time to uh, almost exactly 100 years, I think it was 1917 or, or 1918, there were a number of sort of militant uh, uh, women's rights activists who were gathered in front of the White House in Washington, D.C., and sort of burned an effigy of, of, of pre I guess it was President Woodrow Wilson, and called because they, they thought nothing was happening on the right to vote uh, of women. And, and these women were, were being arrested by the police. They were thrown in, in cars and driven away. And the New York Times had this, this story about how they attacked the, the, the president with, with violent words. So, so you know, in, a, in, a, in the space of 100 years, the enlargement of the protection of free speech has thankfully allowed women to sort of protest against a, a president who uh, quite clearly have said uh, very degrading things uh, about women, and they can do so openly and using words and rhetoric that a hundred years would, would have seen them in prison. Another great example is o Olympe de Gouges, who was uh, a, a French revolutionary and who in 1798, uh, 1791 wrote, now, actually, in 1788, she wrote a play, an abolitionist play that was that was heckled and and had to be given up in Paris just to show what a brave person she was. But then in 1791, she wrote the Declaration of the Rights of Woman because the French Declaration of the Rights of Man from 1789 had sort of been limited to men, and she bas basically said something along the lines, you know, women have the right to be guillotined, and therefore they should also have the right to debate. And unfortunately, she herself was, mm -hmm. was then guillotined uh, uh, later on. So she was a, 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 also an, an essential person for, for the rights of women. You also see saw a lot of abolition in, in the abolitionist movement in the United States. There was this woman called Angelina Grimke, who was raised in the South as, as a slaver's daughter, but then she found, you know, I can't support this. And she went on, on a dramatically effective tour of the United States. Uh, I think she became the first woman to address a, a state legislature. And, and she just uh, had tens of thousands of people uh, sign petitions against uh, slavery. But she talked about intersectionality. <laughs> she sort of addressed the rights of women and, and the rights of, of enslaved blacks as basically being part of the same struggle. And that connection is rarely seen today, unfortunately. You're listening to The Brendan O'Neill Show. If you like this podcast, be sure to subscribe so that you never miss an episode. With most providers like iTunes or Spotify, it's really easy to do with just one click. And if you get this show via YouTube, then make sure you not only subscribe to Spike's YouTube channel, but that you also click the bell so that you are alerted to every new episode. Okay, just a couple more issues I wanted to touch on with you. Uh, the first one is hate speech. And I often think about the issue of hate speech. And I often think about the fact that 25 or 30 years ago, you could have had a reasonable public discussion about whether it was legitimate or not for the state to clamp down on hate speech. And you would have had liberals, some liberals on one side saying, no, even hateful, horrible speech needs to enjoy freedom so that we can see it and understand it and challenge it. And you would have had others who said, uh, no, it must be banned. Today, it's actually quite rare to hear people defend uh, freedom of expression, even for hateful speech. 
uh, uh, you do that. There are a few others who do it too. And I just wanted to ask you, I mean, we all understand, uh, uh, what many of us understand the problem of legitimate political and moral points of view being redefined as hateful speech. So for example, gender critical feminism, which is worried about the excesses of the transgender movement. I think that's a perfectly moral, legitimate moral position, but it gets redefined as bigotry and hate, hatred. But you, uh, like other free speech warriors, go so far as to argue that even speech, which we can all agree is hateful, which is genuinely racist or um, Holocaust denial or, you know, the really bad stuff, even that should not be suppressed and the suppression of it in itself would be problematic. So you can just explain for listeners who may not be familiar with that argument, why you take that position. Well, first of all, you know, there's the problem that the state or, or government will always be the one that defines and enforces uh, hate speech. So there's an inherent danger of scope creep. And and as I mentioned, in, as, and as we've discussed, limits on free speech will always, almost always be used against my uh, minorities and uh, and unpopular groups and the group that is unpopular today might not be the group that is unpopular tomorrow and and so you know if a hate speech law here in the US was adopted and enforced by under the, the the Trump administration and Republicans, it would look very, very different from uh, one adopted and, and enforced by Biden and, 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 and Democrats. And I guess even if there's less polarization in the UK than in the US, you know, you could find members of, of Labour and the Conservatives who have very different ideas about who should be silenced uh, or not when it when it comes to to hate speech. But But more fundamentally, I argue... Uh, I use the, the the brilliant British professor Eric Heinze coined this term the Weimar fallacy, which I use slightly differently from him. So the the basic idea often in Europe is that the fall of the Weimar Republic and the rise of Nazism shows that when confronted with totalitarian ideas and fascist hateful ideas, uh, you need to confront it with militant democracy. In other words, don't give a platform to, to people that want to destroy democracy and adopt racist, uh, ultimately genocide policies. And and I try to show in the book that is not, in my opinion, the lesson you can draw from the fall of the Weimar Republic. In fact, the Weimar Republic had laws, speech restrictive laws that go much further in restricting free, free speech than we would accept even at this time mm -hmm. <laughs> where free speech is in decline in, in, in liberal democracy. So for instance, the radio policy didn't allow either the Nazis or the communists on. And in general, it was sort of only pro-government uh, voices. And uh, they adopted a number of increasingly draconian press laws, which would allow sort of uh, state governments to administratively up to eight weeks ban a newspaper if it had been too critical of state institutions, if it had spread false information or attacked basic uh, institutions. But the problem was that the Nazis sort of used this as a propaganda vehicle. So so Josef Goebbels uh, founded the Angriff, sort of a newspaper. And the reason he founded it was because Hitler was banned from speaking in a number of, of German states. And so, so Josef Goebbels founded this anti-Semitic um, newspaper, which sort of lived off trolling uh, the authorities and especially a Jewish um, police commissioner. And, and he was banned a number of times. And he sort of said gleefully, you know, we're the most frequently banned newspaper in, yeah. in Germany. And, and that appealed to this sense of the Nazis that they were living in an illegitimate uh, state that was sort of uh, suppressing them. Julius Streicher, the worst anti-Semite in history, probably founded Das Stürmer. And he was, you know, 1929, sentenced to two months in prison for religious offense for engaging in these horrible uh, blood libels. And, and he was sort of carried out of the the courtroom by 400 supporters. And then uh, less than a year later, the Nazis dramatically increased their share of votes in the 1930 election, including in Nuremberg, uh, Stryker's hometown where he was convicted. And, you know, numerous other laws. Perhaps the worst example is that the Nazis used Article 48 of the Weimar Constitution that was supposed to protect democracy against its enemies. They used that provision after the, the Reichstag fire to suspend basic liberties, including uh, free speech. And then uh, basically within six months, they created a totalitarian one-party uh, state. 
having done away with first communists and, and socialists and then all the other uh, political parties and institutions that could sort of in any way uh, threaten or, or question uh, Nazi rule. So to me, that's more of a cautionary tale about the good intentions of free speech restrictions, what they may ultimately uh, lead to. So those are among the reasons why I, I think it's problematic. And, you know, if you go to to modern day France, for instance, it's, it's interesting to see the crackdown under Macron, as you alluded to, that actually now means that a number of Muslim organizations have just been administratively banned, and these bans have then been upheld by, by court. So, so a, a Muslim organization which claims to be countering discrimination against uh, Muslims has, has been banned. Uh, I think one of the reasons given was that they had failed to sort of counter anti-Semitism on their social media platforms and had sort of not been denouncing uh, terrorism. And, and likewise, this generation identity sort of a far-right movement, uh, which I think flirts with the white supremacy, even if they sort of a bit coy about it, but, but you know, is not violent, and they were also banned uh, administratively. So to me, that shows the scope creep of, and, and the uh, inherent dangers of, of, of these laws. I think, yes, exactly. And, and you outline very well the the lesson of the Weimar Republic and the, the shift from the Weimar Republic to the rise of Nazism in terms of the way in which censorship, even if it's presented as being well-meaning, can actually exacerbate the sense of victimhood and martyrdom and ultimately the power of those that it's aimed at. And, and I think that's, that's a very well described lesson of the problems of censorship, even in terrible situations. It's not, it's never the solution and it never works. Um, just uh, quickly back to today, I wanted to ask you if you think there's a bit of a pincer movement against freedom of speech at the moment that's coming from both the left and the right. So if you look at the United States, for example, over the past few years, you've had on the one hand, Donald Trump being often incredibly hostile to the media and dismissive of media freedom and and flirting with the idea of having a kind of English style libel law or, or some situation in which he could have hit back against the press and punished the press. And then on the American left, you had instead of a, a meaningful defense of freedom of speech against the, the president's excesses, you had the growth of cancel culture, the intensified loss of faith in freedom of speech. And there was a kind of pincer movement against this fundamental principle of, of liberal democratic society. We see a similar thing in the UK, where we have a left that is very much in favor of cancel culture, very much in favor of unpersoning people who have the incorrect views. But then we have a right-wing government, which is pushing through the online safety bill, uh, which would limit freedom of speech on the internet, which is threatening to punish streaming services like Netflix if they broadcast offensive jokes like uh, Jimmy Carr's recent joke on about Roma people and the genocide of Roma people. So given that it seems very often that both the left and the right may well pay lip service to freedom, but very rarely uphold it. Where do you think that kind of defense of freedom of speech is going to come from? Does it need to come from somewhere completely new? How will that work, do you think? Yeah, that's a very good. Uh, and, and I think it, it, it's more than a pincer movement. So you both have people sort of on the left and, and on the right who are opposed, but you also increasingly have sort of centrists in what I describe as elite panic, centrist uh, governments and institutions who see especially social media as a, as a grave danger towards democracy and who long for the days of of a, a more regulated uh, top-down public sphere with, with the responsible uh, gatekeeper uh, institutions. So, so it's more that free speech is sort of encircled. <laughs> so where is free speech defenders going to come from? Hopefully it will be people from all political walks uh, and ideological walks of life, because I think if free speech is going to, if we're going to counter the free speech recession, it will have to be a nonpartisan, non-ideological uh, effort where, where people who disagree on a, a number of things about the good society, you know, whether the taxes should be high or low, uh, government spending, uh, all kinds of other things, will, but, but can agree that you know, in order for us to be able to live uh, peacefully uh, together, uh, 
and still be good neighbors and friends and colleagues, we need a culture of tolerance and entrench that culture of tolerance in robust uh, laws protecting uh, free speech. And, and I, you know, I, I think there are various groups that, that work uh, f- for these ideals. Another thing, which might sound sort of a bit Machiavellian, is that I think the rise of China may sort of ultimately help invigorate our belief in free speech in the same way that liberals saw free speech as essential during the Cold War. So if the conflict between the West and China sort of intensifies, that might paradoxically serve to make free speech more attractive again, because you cannot look at what's going on in Hong Kong or, you know, the extreme degree of of censorship in in mainland China and not see that free speech or censorship and repression is just part and parcel of, of that system. And that, you know, one of the reasons why we have a better model, at least according to to, to liberal values, is that we allow uh, free speech. So, so that might be another fertilizer of renewed belief in free speech. Of course, the rise of China uh, can also result in, 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 in Western companies sort of selling out. Um, Google and, and others have, have been tempted to, to do so, and, and Cisco, of course, helped construct the, the, the Great Firewall. Uh, so, so it's not a given. But even though we were in a free speech recession, I am somehow still hopeful that the practice and principle of free speech will will survive. But but it'll it, you know it'll like its history. It'll probably go up and down, and perhaps things have to get worse before they before they get better. Jakob, thank you very much indeed. Thank you so much for having me on. It's a pleasure. Thank you for listening to The Brendan O'Neill Show. We'll be back with another guest and more discussion. Don't forget to subscribe. And in the meantime, keep reading Spiked at www.spiked-online.com.